Appreciate it. And thanks, everyone, for joining us this week before Thanksgiving. We really appreciate it. And this is, as Ashley mentioned, this is session number two of the Planning for High Quality Evaluation of Professional Learning. And it's focused on understanding data in the evaluation process, planning process. So myself, I'm Katrina Bledsoe, and I am a research scientist at Education Development Center uh, here in Washington, D.C. And I'll let my colleague and co-presenter, Candice Pocala, introduce herself. Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, I'm Candice Bocala. I'm a senior research associate at WestEd, which is one of the partners on the RHEL Northeastern Islands. I've been a program evaluator, and my interests in terms of research are in professional development for schools uh, and teachers. Great. Thanks, Candice. So we just wanted to um, just follow up Ashley's um, introduction. This is part of the Professional Learning and Development Alliance. This, is, this um, webinar is sponsored by that. And the purpose of the alliance is to support district leaders from the Northeast region to make evidence-based decisions um, in regards to selection, adaption, and scale-ups of uh, professional development programs and, um, and interventions. So the webinar sequence that you're that we're here, as I mentioned before, this is um, webinar sequence or webinar number two. And uh, the first one was establishing the purpose of an evaluation, and that was held on October 11th. And you can of course access the uh, recording through the REL. Um, we have this session, of course, that's being held today, and then session number three which is um, using evaluation information and working with evaluators. And that will be held um, in the new year on January 25th. So we'll be getting to some things that will be answered in that, second, in that third webinar as well. So we realize at times that you may feel like you have some um, questions that might be answered better there. So just to sort of go through and um, and just sort of rep um, repeat the agenda of what we want to accomplish today. We want to sort of go through and give you an introduction and overview of evaluation. Um, we want to sort of recap using evaluation questions to determine study design, and we talked a little bit about that in uh, the first webinar. And then we'll move towards understanding data collection, and then improving data quality. And finally, we'll talk about conclusions and next steps and what you can expect from the following webinar. Um, in the new year. So, so for today, um, we hope that you'll be able to um, review the connection between the purpose for evaluation and evaluation questions, that um, we'll describe the connection between evaluation questions and the design of the study that's needed to answer them and make that connection there, and then understand the various data collection methods and their appropriate uses, including pros and cons. And then finally, we'll explore common ways to enhance data, data quality and conclusions drawn um, from evaluation. So what we'd like to do is to do a sort of quick review of session one for those of you who were there, and then also for those of you who may not have been able um, to make it um, there. So we will sort of we're uh, sort, of, sort of situate you now. Um, we're working with a continuous evaluation model, which is a um, five-step process. And for the first uh, webinar, we looked at step one and step two, which was looking at um, uh, defining and doing a little bit of planning on the evaluation. And today, while we'll recap a little bit of step two, we're going to focus a lot on step three, which is how should the data be collected and analyzed, and also talking a little bit more about the design. So let me sort of recap a little bit here on sort of where we were at the beginning of our first webinar. So there are several types of, of um, general types of evaluation, and that those types of evaluations fall into two categories, formative evaluations and summative evaluations. Formative evaluations actually are looking at um, uh, at the program, at the at the development, in early making early improvements, and sort of 
help us to sort of refine or improve the program. So we're really focused at the beginning and the early stages of the program. Some of the questions are how well is the program being delivered? What strategies can be used to improve the program? The summative evaluations are focused much more on providing information on program effectiveness. And we often conduct a summative evaluation at the completion of a program design. So examples of this type um, are, should the program continue to be funded? Uh, should we expand these services to all programs in the community? So in that case, we're looking at a scale up uh, possibility at a summative evaluation. So um, <clears throat> we have two sets. The needs assessments and the process often fall into the formative evaluation, or they call them evaluations of implementation. And then the outcome and the impact are in the evalu evaluations of impact and fall into the summative aspects. So, so, so needs assessments are toward determining and addressing needs, such as gaps between current conditions and desired conditions or wants. And um, in a lot of cases, some cases we would ask the questions of what training is needed, what level of community engagement is needed. Process evaluations are much more focused on the way program strategies are implemented and planned and focus on program implementation. So some examples are, uh, did your program meet its goals for the recruitment of program participants? Did participants receive the specified number of service hours? So, so those are some of the, the um, kinds of questions that we're interested in when we look at needs assessment and process at the formative stage. At the summative stage, we're looking at outcomes. And often, outcomes are, are looked at in terms to uh, look at, to document the changes in comprehensive attitudes, behaviors, um, and practices that result from program activities. So some examples of outcome evaluations, and you've probably had these many times, um, is did your participants report the desired change after completing a program? Um, what are the long and short term results that are observed um, or reported by participants? And then the impact uh, evaluations focuses really on the long term sustained changes as a result of program activities. Um, and they look at both positive and negative and intended and unintended outcomes. So some examples of an impact are what changes in your program participants' behaviors are attributed to the program? What effects are participants, uh, what effects would participants miss out on without this program? So those are the general types of evaluations that we often um, uh, look at. Thanks, Katrina. So we're going yep. to talk about an example from a real professional learning program because the focus of this um, particular webinar series is on helping people think about how to evaluate professional learning or professional development. So this is a real program uh, being used by a large urban district in the Northeast. We've given it a pseudonym and called it the STEM Partnership Program because this is a program focused on helping teachers and students um, with high school and middle school science, mathematics, engineering, and technology, or STEM. Uh, this partnership was created in this large urban district where teachers, educators, and parents had expressed concern that not enough students enter high school with the skills they need to be successful in STEM. And they were also concerned that due to budgetary and resource constraints, students didn't have access to engaging in rigorous STEM learning opportunities in their communities. So in order to follow along with us, what I would recommend is if you could download the handout one, which is the professional learning scenario. It tells a lot more information about this program, including a logic model, which we will go through shortly. Um, but just to tell you, the, the essence of this program was a partnership between universities, the large urban public school district, and then some other organizations, such as a hospital, an engineering company, and parents. And they were hoping to bolster teachers' learning um, in STEM and also encourage middle and high school students to get interested in STEM content early and keep their interest all the way through high school. So through this partnership, they focused on building teachers' content and pedagogical knowledge. The main professional activities that they engaged in included teachers spending summers in workshops at local universities. Um, they learned how to conduct interdisciplinary research together with STEM higher education faculty and other university students. Those university students 
also worked with the teachers during the school year to support planning and designing inquiry-based curricula. The teachers participated in professional learning communities, or PLCs, during the school year to discuss their progress in STEM education. Faculty and university students also provided direct support to the middle and high school students by offering to teach clubs and after school and weekend science um, clubs in their schools. So there were several opportunities uh, for these different groups to partner together in this program. And it was really all about building teachers' no content knowledge and application of STEM in the community. So go ahead and download that handout number one uh, so you can follow along with us in our professional learning scenario. I'm going to show the logic model that we created in session one, uh, which was the last time we all met together. So if you're interested in how to create a logic model or the process for creating a logic model, um, we suggest that you um, go back and view that recording when it's available. But basically, these are the components of a logic model. And one thing you'll notice is that um, we'll be going back to this logic model throughout our discussion, mostly focused on the outcomes that the program is aiming for, because we're going to talk today about creating evaluation questions that are trying to target those outcomes. So we're going to enter step two of our continuous evaluation model, which is plan. And here, we'll, here we will talk about using those evaluation questions and the connections of study design. So in this step, we want to think about what questions should this evaluation answer and using what design. These guiding questions are also written on a handout that we have made available to you, so you can download them from the Download Today's Files pod. Um, this is called the Evaluation Planning Template, and we have put the guiding questions that we'll be talking through on this template. So if you were to, um, if you were to need this for your own work, you can uh, follow along with the questions as we talk them through. So when people usually ask, an evaluator um, to understand, is this professional learning and development program working? They're really asking a couple of different questions. And sometimes it's um, hard to know exactly what they mean. So these are three examples of questions that can be generically applied to many professional learning programs um, of various kinds. So the, the problem is, if you're asking a question, is this program working, that's too general. There are so many different possible questions you're really asking. You might be asking, for example, how do teachers feel about this program? You might also be asking, what are the effects of this program on the teachers? Are they using what they've learned? And then you also might be asking, what are the effects of the program on students? So all of those different questions are ways to think about, is the program working? So we want to invite you just to get your thinking started for a moment here. Um, by engaging you in a chat activity, what kinds of information might you need in order to answer these questions? So take a moment and think that through. Which question are you trying to answer? And what kind of information might you pull out to try to answer those questions? It might be helpful if you tell us which question you're trying to answer. So Violet, teacher satisfaction information from survey data. Sure. So I could see that connected to how do teachers feel about this program? Also, what are the effects of the program on teachers? Um, Diana is interested in answering question number one by looking at teacher engagement. Um, I'm interested in how you would measure that, Diana. What do you think you might um, do to measure teacher engagement? Um, Sandra's point about question three is we would look at student achievement data. Um, Martha is saying, teacher focus group or surveys and observations of teachers in the classroom. I think that would be really useful to look at the effects of the program, uh, especially if you're expecting teachers to actually implement something that they learned. Um, Jill, it would be helpful to have baseline data on student performance before the treatment. Yes, that's a good point, and that's actually a very particular kind of study design that we'll talk about in just a moment if you wanted to look at change over time. Um, you would need baseline data as well as your um, final data. So we'll just take a few more answers here and then and go ahead and move on to the next. Um, all of these ideas are great. It shows that obviously you all in your various roles have been thinking a lot about how to answer some of these broader questions. 
Um, but what we really want to focus on here is we need to have a more specific question than just, is this program working? We need to have some kind of focus for how to target that question. So we'll go ahead and go back to our um, slides here. Um, we'll hang on to your chat results, because we'll come back to discussing those in a moment. But two recommendations that we have for making a more specific evaluation question are to use the logic model which we will go through an example in just a moment, and then to consider, are you interested in formative questions or summative questions? Sometimes this depends on the needs of your program. It also depends on um, where you are in the program's um, life cycle. Are you toward the beginning of the program, or are you really more at the end? So we'll walk through an example of each of these. So two common types of evaluation questions, as Katrina mentioned earlier, are those formative questions, which you would identify toward the beginning, um, maybe about process or about implementation. And you would ask these questions in order to affect program improvement or to make mid-course corrections. Summative evaluation questions are more for the end of a program when the program is wrapping up or completed. You're really looking at your results and your outcomes. And you're trying to make some decisions about whether to continue the program, scale the program, or um, make other changes to the program to do it again. So back to our logic model. Again, it's really important before you start any of this evaluation planning to have a really detailed logic model. Um, but you'll notice here that we're focusing in on a short-term outcome that the STEM partnership stakeholders wanted to know um, how did teachers experience the STEM professional learning communities? If you remember, a big part of this program was getting high school and middle school teachers together with university faculty who taught science, technology, and math, together with community organizations like hospitals that regularly use science, technology, and math. So how did, how did the teachers experience these STEM professional learning communities? So that's a question that might come out of one of their short-term outcomes, which was they wanted to know that the PLC members reported a positive experience after having participated in those PLCs. So we're, we'd like to ask you, what other formative questions can you think of that might be helpful for this program to consider? Go ahead and put your responses into the chat. You can see the logic model up at the top. Maybe you might pick another one of their short-term outcomes and form that into a question. Or you could think about other professional development programs that you've worked with. What are some formative questions that might be similar? OK, Jill's question, how many teachers are involved and what kinds of activities are they engaged in? Sure, that's definitely a descriptive kind of a question. You'd want to know what's the reach of this program, maybe documenting the activities. Uh, Sandra, your, your uh, phrase there is about fidelity measures. Um, I'm wondering what the question might be that you might turn that into. Is the question, is this program being implemented with fidelity? That's certainly a good question to ask. You'd want to know from the program designer's point of view what, what is fidelity. What are some of the key components that have to happen in this program in order to um, make it successful? Maybe one more formative question. To what extent is the program implemented after each year of implementation? Um, Andrew, that's a really good question to try to think about it after every year. I'm curious um, what you mean by implemented. So you could say, Maybe back to this question of how many teachers were involved. OK, this is a fidelity question as well. Um, was the program implemented with its key components? That's a very basic definition of fidelity. All right, so we'll show the summative question that might uh, also be interesting to explore. So the summative question comes from a longer term outcome. The, the people who founded this program and who run this program also were very interested in seeing if students' learning outcomes improve, right? The whole purpose was to give middle and high school students access to STEM coursework, inquiry-based science and technology lessons, um, access to uh, businesses that use STEM in their real work so students can see how their learning would be applied. 
so of course we would want to know do their outcomes improve so the summative question that goes along with this outcome is how did the program affect students learning outcomes in stem we're not assuming that they're going to improve so the summative question is open ended right how did it affect their learning outcomes so it's your turn again what other summative kinds of questions might you imagine this program asking You might take a look at those long-term outcomes that they were hoping for. Some of those outcomes are about teachers and other community members. They're not all about students. So a question from Kim is, I'd want to know what affect, if it affected teacher knowledge and preparedness. Sure. So after having participated in this program, are teachers more knowledgeable and more prepared to teach in science? Uh, technology and engineering and math. Um, do more students eventually pursue STEM in higher education? Yep, that's definitely a longer term question because we can't answer that um, after the first few years, but you might be able to see that after those students have graduated. Um, do teachers feel more connected to the STEM community? Yes, I think that's a really interesting summative question because after having participated in those professional learning communities, do they feel like they can now reach out to colleagues who are in the hospital or working in the engineering firm uh, that they got connected to through this project? So those are all really great summative questions. Um, we're going to hang on to those as we continue through our example here. Um, and the key takeaway is a good place to find your evaluation questions is to go back to your logic models, to really ask, what are my short-term outcomes? What are my long-term outcomes? And can I create some questions that will try to get at, are we reaching those outcomes? So having a good logic model is the important foundation for any good evaluation. Another decision that you'll have to make is about study design. So once you know you, what your evaluation questions are, you need to know how you're going to answer those questions. And this leads us into different types of study designs. The study design you choose is going to affect the types of conclusions that you're going to be able to draw. So there are three kinds of study designs that we'd like to review for today. This is just one framework. Um, there's other ways of thinking about this. But we'll talk about exploratory, descriptive, and causal studies. Exploratory studies are the discovery of new insights and ideas. Um, they're usually conducted for problems that have not been studied very clearly. Um, they um, might be good to use at the beginning of a professional learning program to describe what people think about it, what experiences they're having. So an example question for this might be, what do teachers learn through this professional learning and development? A descriptive study explains the characteristics of a group, makes categories that gives us a picture of what is going on, or it examines relationships between those categories or variables. It does not answer questions about how, when, or why certain groups have occurred or characteristics have occurred, but it answers the what questions, such as what are the characteristics of the student population or the teacher population that participated. Um, it could be good to use to examine which teachers participate in this professional learning and development program and what their backgrounds are, which teachers get more out of the program, which teachers tend to stay in the program, um, so an example question here might be, how does the professional learning and development program relate to uh, teacher retention? This is the kind of descriptive study where you're examining a relationship between two variables or categories of interest. And this kind of information you can get from frequencies, averages, um, summations, and calculations. So the last kind of study is the causal study. This, co this kind of a study examines whether a program causes a change. And it's usually posed as, does a change in x cause a change in y? To do a causal study, you need to have conditions that allow you to do an experiment or a way to simulate an experiment. This type of research is called explanatory research. And to examine causality, you have to try to isolate the extent to which the program caused the change. So for example, you might have one group of teachers who participate in the professional learning and one group that doesn't. So then you would compare their results. Um, this is a very simple design, but compare their results on um, student outcomes in order to answer this question uh, in the example, does participation in the professional learning and development increase student achievement? 
So as I mentioned, causal studies are a very, very specific kind of design. So it's worth just spending a little more time on them. Because often, as evaluators, we get questions where people have in their minds that they want to know what the effect of, an, of a program is or what the impact of a program is. And they are asking causal questions. But because these study designs are the most rigorous and the most complicated to try to enact, um, we just want to have people be aware that there are certain conditions that have to be met before you can actually answer um, a study with a causal design. So one thing that needs to happen is you need to have some kind of an experimental group. These studies try to eliminate all the possible alternative explanations for an effect. So if you sent all your all your teachers to the professional learning development in STEM, but then you also had some teachers who decided to participate in an optional after-school instructional coaching program also in science, how do you know if it was the workshop or the coaching that made a difference on their instructional practice? So teachers work in conditions like this all the time. They're involved in several initiatives that try to change their practice, so it's hard to do a true experimental study. But these true studies, experimental studies, can be designed in a way that takes into account all those other factors. One way to do this is through a process called random assignment, where you randomly ask some teachers to participate in a professional learning and development program. And the other teachers, who were also willing and interested in participating in that program, they get assigned to a control group. This group would be a comparison group, because they would be doing business as usual without the intervention. However, in education, it is often logistically different to randomly assign teachers to different groups. So instead, it's more common to do what we call a quasi-experimental study. That's where you don't rely on random assignment. And these studies are based on finding a group of teachers to use as a comparison group. But you have to make sure that the comparison teachers are as similar in background, experience, school location, and other characteristics to the treatment group of teachers as possible. You can do all of this if you have a large enough group of teachers in your study and you need some advanced statistics. So while we're not going to go into these methods today, we wanted you to be aware of them because when you talk with an evaluator or a researcher, we just want you to know that if you ask if the program causes the outcomes you're expecting, you just need to know if a causal study design would be possible with the program that you're trying to evaluate. So we will move on to step three, which is all about data collection. Thanks, Candace. Um, so, um, as Candace mentioned, we'll be on. Uh, we're moving to um, the implementation part and uh, understanding data collection. So, um, as we, what we want to do is be able to sort of situate um, where we are in the continuous evaluation model. So, as you can see, where we are is looking at how should the data be collected and analyzed. So. Um, the next piece of this will focus on um, data collection methods and how we might want to analyze that. But let's go ahead and sort of situate all of that in the example that we mentioned earlier. So this is our STEM partnership. And um, so what um, we wanted to sort of lay out for you is once you have your evaluation questions and you sort of look at what study design you want to use, and taking into consideration some of the study designs Candace mentioned earlier. Um, this step here relates to um, gathering the data uh, that can answer those questions. Um, always remember that the logic model is really where we start in terms of trying to get an idea of how we move forward in terms of uh, the outcomes that we want and the questions that we're asking. So that should always ground us. So, um, here in our example, we have two um, pieces to look at. So teachers report satisfaction with professional learning development. And then from there, that's our logic model outcome. And then for the student side, we're also looking at student learning outcomes in STEM improvement. So I'll actually take the first one. Um, the evaluation questions for teachers reporting satisfaction for professional learning um, development, the evaluation question is, how do teachers experience the STEM um, PLC, which um, that is the evaluation question that we're grounded on. And that's a broader question. So the study design that seems to fit here would be much more exploratory. Then we start moving towards um, 
what kind of data sources that we can ask in terms of looking at um, exploratory designs. And these are sort of trying to keep an idea, an idea of what actually, what data sources actually fit the exploratory design. As far as the students' learning outcomes in STEM improvement, the evaluation question we might want to ask here is also, how did the program affect student learning outcomes in STEM? And in that case, we're interested in how the program did. And so the study design might be a causal design, in which case we want to know what can be attributed to the program. And then we think about data sources that would be appropriate for that as well. So, um, and you can probably refer to your um, handout um, on evaluation planning templates. Um, so with step three, some of the guiding questions that we're going to ask are, how should the data be collected? Will you use qualitative or quantitative data? Um, are there considerations um, that, are, um, that are related to utility, feasibility, propriety, and accuracy? Have those been addressed? And Candace will go through those a little bit later in this presentation. Um, and also, finally, how should the data be analyzed? So those are the guiding questions when you start to think about it and, and putting it into context of the example that we have. So let's talk a little bit about some of the data, um, uh, the data types that we mentioned, qualitative versus quantitative. And no doubt, many of you have heard the difference between the two. Um, qualitative data um, comes from talking to participants directly and usually with written um, um, or uh, written observations or documents or response to open-ended questions. So regardless of, of any study design, there are two types of, of data that you're going to collect. collect. And um, <clears throat> it's also important to sort of make sure that your evaluation questions and the study design that you choose sort of align with those data sources. Um, exploratory and descriptive studies often use both types of data. So, for example, um, as you, um, if you're looking at, if you're looking at, um, uh, excuse me, let me refocus here real quickly. Let me go back and sort of put quantitative data here as well. As I mentioned, qualitative data was talking to participants directly. Qualitative, quantitative data are numeric counts scores and summaries of information that can be manipulated. And as I mentioned before, you can use both types of, of data. And um, often exploratory and, quality and descriptive studies use both types of data. So if you're going to ask teachers, uh, for example, um, where, where they were able to apply the learning from a professional learning development program in their classroom, you would probably do interviews or observations or, or ask them how, how they've used uh, their learning or describe what you see in the classroom. So that's an opportunity to use both data. Um, usually, causal studies rely on collecting a large amount of quantitative data um, rather than qualitative data. Because of the size and the need for a lot of participants, it can be hard to collect a lot of interviews and observations. So therefore, quantitative data is more desirable. Um, also, causal studies often use advanced statistics, which often works better um, if all the variables are quantifiable, so if you're able to, to provide a numeric behind that. Um, so for example, uh, you could ask if a professional learning development program um, causes an increase in teacher's knowledge as measured by an assessment of, of content knowledge. Um, and it's also important to consider when you're thinking about qualitative, the use of qualitative versus quantitative data, it's also important to consider the cost of the data collection activities um, when you're planning for evaluation. Typically, qualitative data are much more costly to, to collect because they take more time and you only get one participant or just a few participants' viewpoints at one time. Quantitative data can be a little less costly to collect because it can already be used in a, in a database. But either way, definitely consider the cost on both, on both types of data that you would collect. So, um, there are some data sources, which is where is where does your evidence often come from? Um, so there are common data sources that you've probably heard of and, um, and may have been a part of or even used yourself, which are interviews, focus groups, surveys, observations, 
document reviews, and then existing data, quantitative data, which is um, assessment of test results, district demographics, teacher evaluation ratings, and you might hear existing quantitative data also as referred to as um, secondary data. So we'll go through a couple of some of those data sources that we were talking about, um, and I'll go through a few here, and uh, both Candace and I will. And so we'll talk a little bit about um, some of the data sources that we just mentioned here. So often, I know a lot of folks have heard about um, data sources such as interviews, and there are definitely advantages and disadvantages to, both, to conducting an interview. Some of the advantages are that it provides an in-depth answers. Um, and robust answers. It also can permit for more follow-up detail or clarification. And then it also is a way to build a connection and rapport between the interviewer and the interviewee, um, which also helps the interviewee be a lot more relaxed and much more honest in the answers that they might provide. Um, some of the disadvantages about doing an interview was, is that it is a lengthy data collection period. It might take a, a fair amount of time. It is costly because it takes a fair amount of time, and usually you're only using one or just a very few participants. You might, gain, you might not have access to everyone that you might um, want to interview. And then also, what people say is not always what they might do. Um, and finally, the idea about dealing with um, anonymity, it's more, in the, more on a, 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 an emphasis on confidentiality rather than anonymity. So those can be some of the disadvantages, or I like to call them a little bit more challenges in terms of dealing with um, um, interviews. Focus groups are also another um, well-known method, and a focus group allows for an interaction of our participants. So if you're gaining a fair amount of participants, because you usually have anywhere between six to eight participants, sometimes more, um, that interaction between participants might actually increase the robustness of the responses um, and enhance responses. And then also, um, they can be efficient in terms of collection of, of qualitative data from a group. So rather than just one or two participants that you might have in an interview, you can actually get um, more in that perspective. Um, but the disadvantages of using a focus group, which is, is sometimes that group interaction might inhibit responses. So you're only getting one, you may only get one or two um, points of view despite having six or eight or nine people in the room. Um, and then sometimes respondents aren't always willing to speak in a group. Um, some fear retribution, some fear um, this or become more shy. And then also, if you're looking at complex su subject matter, um, it doesn't always allow everyone to respond. So you still may not be getting quite um, the amount of people that you would like. And then finally, there's no anonymity, which of course also um, can play in terms of the kind of information you get. And now you're, you know, the worry about anonymity is a little bit more um, is a little bit larger because now you have other people just besides the interviewer um, to contend with. And then you also have heard the data source and probably been a part of um, several times, surveys. Surveys are, are pretty common and, and often used, and I think we deal with surveys in a wide variety of settings. Some of the advantages of them is they can cover a wide, wide range of topics, um, you can get a lot of participants, and they're relatively inexpensive to administer. Um, we all know that you can do them a lot online. Of course, there are telephone surveys, there are computer surveys, um, and then and then there's also in person. Um, and then it can include it can include both qualitative and quantitative data, and um, it also is able to help with anonymity. So uh, folks are more likely to, in a lot of ways. Um, to participate in surveys, um, and it doesn't require that, that uh, connection that you may need in some of the, qualita the qualitative groups. There are some disadvantages to using that. Is that a, very similar to just about any data collection method, self-report might not always match 
what um, what people actually do. And surveys don't always often get to the depth of, of things. Um, and often, it's uh, it's not uncommon to use qualitative data to provide some of the why behind um, what you may get in a survey. And then um, response rates are very, very important. So the lower the response rate, the harder it is um, to actually be able to generalize. Um, and we know that often on, in um, uh, surveys, it's very difficult to get uh, high response rates. And in fact, the average response rate on both online and in-person is anywhere between 30 and 40 percent um, on a good day. So um, that can be a real challenge at times. Um, so um, given what we've just been talking about, I want to give you an opportunity to sort of um, give us some other ex advantages or disadvantages do um, these data sources that I've just been mentioning have that may have been in, um, that you may have experienced. So take a little bit of time and use the chat. I see Kendra, thank you Kendra, says that interviewers can be biased by the interviewer. Uh, that's very correct. Thank you so much for that. And often that that is something that we struggle with. And um, uh, also just to remind folks, uh, folks, please let us know if it's an advantage or a disadvantage. Thank you, Candace. And I see other folks are talking. Kendra again is saying that it's a bias is a disadvantage. Denise. Um, says that all visible options, uh, all can be viable options, but asking the right question is a challenge, very much so. Thank you, Denise. And Martha says, as, uh, what if people you interview either don't fully participate or don't show up? Um, maybe biased input. Absolutely. So just getting sort of one group of people and, and trying to extrapolate to a, a larger group. And I see a few others are typing. Um, and then uh, Candace mentions that uh, it's the same problem as the survey response rates. Stephanie says that the interpretation of interview and focus group responses may, may differ um, by interviewer, and that is a, a, a challenge of using uh, interview and focus group responses, so trying to uh, coordinate response, um, understanding of, of uh, data, data analysis. Say. And Martha again says that qualitative data can can greatly inform interpretation of quantitative data. So that's a that is definitely a um, an advantage of that. And often we talk about using both of them um, uh, together. And you've no doubt heard the term mixed methods. And then um, also Deborah says that it's important to separate teacher and principal participants during focus groups. And of course, that, that definitely depends on the, the, the questions that you want to ask as well, because those can be biased, certainly. Um, principals can certainly bias teachers and, and probably vice versa. Um, Stephanie, again, says that responses can lead to additional questions that need to be explored. Um, so that is uh, an advantage of that, of, of those methods. So we, um, we thank you for those, those comments. Those are very, very helpful. And I'm going to actually turn it over to Candace. Yes, so we have three other kinds of data sources that we just want to talk through very quickly. And then again, hear from you. What do you think are some additional advantages and disadvantages? Um, so one data source that we do use in evaluations is observations. This is great for collecting direct evidence about behavior or application um, where you don't have to rely on a teacher saying she or he used the uh, new science inquiry methods. You can actually watch it in the classroom. And it can give you information about that situation or the context in which they're applying their learning. However, observations are definitely time consuming. You actually have to sit there in real time, take notes, um, you know, watch a couple of teachers or many teachers over a period of time, so they tend to be more costly. It's also important to train your observers so they are not just taking notes in a different fashion or not observing with a particular focus. Um, there's the old, um, I guess, adage or saying that the presence of observer affects the behavior in the room. 
so if, if there's an observer in your classroom, those of us who are teachers know this, when there's somebody else in your classroom, the students never act the way they would if there was nobody else in the classroom but you, the teacher. Um, so this observation may actually be atypical. Um, another data source is the document review. So what's nice about document reviews is the data already exists somewhere. Either these are notes from professional development meetings, or they are the curriculum from the professional development, or the curriculum that teachers have produced. Um, so you don't really have to create new data. You can just get the documents. Um, they provide information on historical trends um, or public attitudes if you're getting that information from an existing database. Um, and they're unobtrusive. You're not asking anybody for time to sit down and talk to you or time for a survey. You can just collect the documents uh, and analyze them. So the disadvantage is some documents may, may be incomplete or inaccurate, depending on how the data were gathered. And then sometimes the analysis for document reviews can be time consuming. You'll actually have to read through the documents, um, look at the documents, and have a, have a way of coding or categorizing the information that you're seeing. And then the last data source, um, which people think about a lot, is the existing quantitative data. So this is data like student assessment scores, uh, student responses on surveys, um, that's quantitative data as well as qualitative data from surveys, um, student attendance rates, student graduation rates, teacher attendance rates, all of these things are quantitative data. Um, they provide objective information, meaning their numeric counts, something either happened or it didn't happen. Um, they're usually constructed to measure a particular indicator like um, attendance. And they're pretty straightforward to analyze if you know statistics. So you can do everything from uh, count up, how many people uh, were in a particular category, all the way through some of that more complicated causal analysis that I mentioned earlier. And then the disadvantage is sometimes quantitative data might oversimplify your findings. You won't be able to know why a certain um, category or group has more respondents or more people in it than the others. You just will know how many. Um, you also might need to negotiate access to the data, for example, privacy considerations. So especially with student data um, and any personally identifiable information, you would want to take care that you are um, being careful to protect privacy and confidentiality with those records. So let's go back to our chat and just take a moment to think about what other advantages or disadvantages do those last three kinds of data sources have. So we'll think here about observations, document reviews, and existing quantitative data. Go ahead and take a moment and tell us what you think about these sources in the chat. So Stephanie's point is that document review might be misinterpreted if you don't know the context of the document. Yes, that's absolutely true. Um, looking back over a meeting agenda may not be helpful if you don't know what the purpose of the meeting was or who was there or what, why it's taking place. Um, Martha is talking about time and resource limitations. Might, you might not get a representative sample of observations. Yeah, that's a great point because you're sending people out to go sit in classrooms and you, you can't um, observe all teachers, so you may need to pick a sample or a subset of the teachers. So the question is, is that sample representative? Um, Stephanie is, has a data quality point here, actually. Quantitative data, you need to know how the data was gathered and the definitions of the data elements. So when people often input data into large-scale databases, they have very strict protocols about what kinds of data and how to gather the data, and if you don't know how that happened, sometimes you may make errors in your analysis. Um, so Jill's point, it's, it's difficult to get the same kind of data for all students if different tests are given over different years. Yep, it's hard to do a longitude, what we call a longitudinal study um, if you don't necessarily have all of the data from that isn't a stable assessment over multiple years. Um, we all know that many states recently have been changing their summative assessments, for example, and so um, it can be hard to compare year to year. Um, Martha's point, quanti quantitative data, such as accountability system test scores, often occur only once per, per year. Um, and so assessing multiple measures or over time would be better. Um, and then uh, barrier to observations from Denise is inter establishing inter-rater reliability. Yes, we'll talk about this a little bit more when we talk about accuracy. 
but it's important to have some training for your observers as well as what we call observation protocols so that they're going in and they're looking for the same information um, and they're not just kind of writing down whatever comes to their minds um, and not, uh, not aware of the focus. Um, and then Sylvia, if the observer is not aware of background information on how the information was gathered, it may not be accurate. Um, so thanks for all of those suggestions for other advantages and disadvantages. Um, the big takeaway point here is just to be aware that when you're selecting data sources, um, you want to make sure to maximize the potential that you're getting um, of that information from that data and balancing that against the possible um, issues that might come up. So we're going to actually move right into a poll. And um, we want to know, after having gone through all of those different data sources, what would you use to try to answer that question that we have been posing as an example? How did teachers experience the STEM professional learning communities? We're doing an exploratory study to try to answer that question. So answer in the poll, what are some data sources that teachers, um, evaluators, or other um, educators in the district, what might you gather to answer those questions? give you a moment to answer, and then we'll share with you the results. If you can think of additional data sources that are not listed here, obviously I just picked a couple of different kinds for you to choose from. Go ahead and put them into the chat box that's over there to the right um, of additional data sources you might collect. Just starting us out by saying you could also gather satisfaction surveys. Yep. Um, satisfaction surveys, who would you gather that from, would be one question. Uh, Diana says interviews with teachers. Yep, that's a great way to gather data fra for how was their experience. So we can go ahead and broadcast those results. Um, it seems like the most popular source of data is the focus group with teachers. So that's very similar to the interview process where perhaps this district might have decided that due to time and resource constraints, they couldn't do individual interviews. They do, so instead, they were going to pull teachers together for a focus group. Um, a couple of people decided that they would look at PLC meeting agendas. I think that's actually a really interesting way to get at um, teachers' experience, because you could see how much um, activity was happening in those meetings by looking at their agendas. You can see whether teachers had input into the agenda. Um, how often teachers had to interact on the agenda. Um, so that could be a really interesting um, one for a document review. Um, and then a couple of people have chosen student work portfolios. Um, I'm interested if anybody chose that, if you want to make a case for that in the chat, because um, that to me seems a little further away from teachers' experiences. I guess you could try to see whether teachers applied what they learned in the PLC to the student work and then you would be looking at the student work portfolios, but that's maybe one step beyond what we were thinking. Um, and then the last option here, interviews with university STEM faculty, that's actually a great um, data collection source in this particular example because university STEM faculty were part of these PLCs. Remember, it was a cross-institutional effort where they had universities partnering with the district and partnering with parents and businesses. So we could also see, as a university faculty member, did you participate in the PLC and did you get something out of it, even though you're not a K-12 educator? So we're going to do another similar activity here, um, just with that summative question that we've been using as an example. So we'll switch over, and this is the second question. How did the program affect student learning, students' learning outcomes in STEM? And we're going to think about using a causal design, so that rigorous design where we want to try to isolate the effect of the program on student learning outcomes. So what kind of data would we collect here? Go ahead and see what you might collect as the most likely source of data or sources of data. You can select more than one. Um, and then on the sidebar on the right, if you have additional data sources that you might look at, go ahead and put those in.
So Martha says again, student surveys. Um, yeah, I think there is an opportunity to think about all the different ways we could get at um, student learning outcomes. So not just assessment scores. It could be students' interest in STEM. It could be students' um, interest in future STEM careers. Uh, are you a, are you a, intending to go to college or university or in the workplace and use your STEM education? Um, so yeah, there's lots of different things you could survey students to understand how they're thinking about this. So let's go ahead and broadcast the results from the poll. Uh, so from the poll, it looks like the most common choice was student science assessment scores. I think that's a pretty straightforward outcome, uh, not outcome, but a pretty straightforward data source in this case, because if we wanted to do a causal design, we might use some statistics to try to see if different factors um, affected students science assessment scores. Um, some people also selected, looks like it's about even, um, 16 and 16 percent of people selected interviews with parents as well as surveys filled out by teachers. So this is interesting. I'm not sure for surveys filled out by teachers how much you would get at the student learning outcomes unless you're asking teachers about using what they're learning in the classroom and how their students are reacting. Um, so you could design a survey where you're asking teachers, how are students reacting to this content, sure. Um, interviews with parents could be a really useful thing to get at if you're asking parents if um, the students are trying to, uh, are applying what they're learning. But we're doing a causal design here. So one thing to remember is if you're trying to isolate the effects of a particular variable, a particular um, cause from the program on an outcome, Sometimes it's harder to do that with qualitative data. So while I think it's really important that we talk to parents about whether their, their children are using the knowledge they're learning in schools, you'd have to figure out a way to quantify that if you wanted to put that into a statistical model. So that's one of the reasons why that's probably a less obvious data source here. And then um, the one that was selected by about 40% of people is course enrollment records from high school. So this also could be really useful as a quantitative data source, how many students go on and enroll in this um, STEM courses in high school. So other suggestions from folks is people are thinking about looking at ACT or changes in students needing remedial college STEM courses, um, assessment scores in other subjects like math, science, and engineering, and technology. Sorry, math, engineering, and technology, not just science. And then um, Denise, observations. So yes, I, uh, that's a similar issue with the qualitative data here. If you wanted to do a, a causal study, it can be harder to quantify that observational data in a way that allows you to use the statistics you might need for a causal study. But all of those are really great ideas. Um, yes, Kim, if we could get some records of future employment in STEM, that might also be interesting uh, to examine here. So we'll move on to the last part of our uh, discussion today, which is all about improving data quality. So when we talk about data quality, um, somebody already brought this up earlier, this idea of accuracy and reliability in our data. And there's some common considerations for data quality as you are beginning an evaluation. So you want to think about how can you enhance completeness of your data by increasing participation. You can also enhance representativeness by making decisions about sampling, such as trying to get as many participants as possible from all kinds of backgrounds, experiences, um, roles in, in the program. You can examine completeness by checking to see whether all the data are available for the time period of interest in your evaluation. And then you also need to think about how to make valid inferences or draw conclusions from the data. Um, you might be able to improve the data quality, uh, sorry, data collection instruments, um, ensuring that your data instruments are consistent, they're easy to understand, and they minimize the burden on the part of participants, um, so participants will complete them. And you also want to train your data collectors so that everybody has a consistent way of collecting that data. So there are some popular um, considerations that we've uh, culled here from the CDC. And they are also part of the um, program evaluation standards. And these considerations are usability, feasibility, propriety, and accuracy. So for usability, we want to think about questions such as 
um, whether and how the evaluation information will be used, and will that information be seen as credible. So for example, in the STEM partnership program, if they were trying to improve their professional learning communities, you'd want to be sure that your teachers, parents, and university faculty who are part of the PLCs can provide input into which data are most, most credible and most useful for them. You also want to avoid using data that's not for its intended purpose. So for example, you wouldn't want to use scores on an assessment that students take as a baseline at the beginning of the year to determine how much students have learned at the end of the year. Right? That's a pretty um, common example of how you wouldn't use that baseline data. And then feasibility relates to whether the data collection plan is realistic and if there are enough resources to complete it. So if you're trying to improve those PLCs, you probably wouldn't spend the time doing an in-depth observation of every single PLC meeting. But instead, you might select a sample. Right? Observing all PLC meetings is not feasible. So additionally, this component asks you to consider if you will be able to get the data you want from your participants, knowing who they are. So if, for example, you were to be surveying young children, you would want your questions and your vocabulary to be age appropriate so they can understand what's being asked. So we want to make sure that those methods and sources are consistent with the culture and the characteristics of your participants. The two other considerations are propriety and accuracy. Propriety is about whether the data can be collected in a way that's not overly burdensome. So for example, you wouldn't ask people to complete two hour, three hour long interviews. You'd probably lose their attention after about uh, 60 to 90 minutes. Um, you wouldn't ask people to complete a survey that takes four hours. Um, it's just not, it's just not um, feasible for them. So this is uh, related to avoiding evaluation burden. It's also important to respect issues of confidentiality and safety such as not revealing that personal information in the data if you've promised them that it's confidential or anonymous. And there are some other ethical considerations that we think about, including ensuring that people have a chance to consent to be part of the data collection so they know that they are participating in a study or an evaluation, letting them know that their participation is voluntary and they can stop at any time, and they should always be able to opt in or out of data collection. And then the last consideration is accuracy which means avoiding mistakes and errors in data entry. In this case, evaluators would want to make sure that there is a clear and consistent process to collect the data. If several people are observing PLC meetings and taking notes, as we've already said, you would want to be sure that they have the training so they can be on the same page to know what they're looking for and how to record their notes. So those are some considerations. And let's apply those considerations to our last activity here. So let's pull it all together and think about a new evaluation question, this one we haven't been working with so far. But let's say the district wanted to use the evaluation question, how and in what ways did the STEM partnership change teachers' instruction? Right? In order to get good student outcomes, we first have to change teachers' behaviors and teachers' instruction. So this district might decide to collect the data on teacher instruction in two ways. They might issue a teacher survey they might observe teachers in their classrooms. Those are two data collection sources they chose. So what issues may come up related to um, data quality? Would you be concerned about utility, feasibility, propriety, and accuracy? And use, use the poll to tell us what you're concerned about, and then use the chat to tell us why. So I'll do a quick review of the different definitions of each of those. Remember, utility relates to how credible and useful the data are and whether you're using the data according to how they are intended to be used. Feasibility relates to whether the data collection plan is realistic and there are enough resources to complete it. Propriety is about whether the data can be collected in a way that's not overly burdensome. And accuracy relates to having a clear and consistent process for collecting the data to avoid mistakes and errors in data entry. So it looks like we've got a lot of people selecting propriety. I'd be really interested to hear why. Why would you be concerned about propriety? This is about avoiding evaluation burden. So what might be the problem with these data sources that you would want to try to avoid? Susan is saying, ideally, we would be concerned about all of these. Sure. I think that's um, why these criteria are important and why it's nice to know that all four of these criteria exist. So you always want to do a little mental check to see are we, have we covered all of our bases here. 
Um, Stephanie's point probably about propriety is that observing in the classroom could be disruptive. Yep, so you'd want to make sure that teachers are okay with that and um, you have a way to ensure that it's not interrupting instruction. Um, feasibility also, Jennifer's point, um, how can you feasibly observe all of those classrooms? Um, Jesse says teacher survey could be long. Okay, yep, people may not do it accurately. There's always the challenge in surveys of people doing responding to a scale, and some people think that one end of the scale means one thing when really it's actually another. So you have people saying strongly disagree when really they mean strongly agree. So you'd want to make sure that those scales are clear. Um, Diana is saying you would want to make sure that any instruction changes are related to the intervention. I think that's how we try to isolate that is through the study design, Diana, wanting to have something more, trying to look at a causal study design. Um, and then Dottie says, if we're observing teachers to look for change, we will have needed data and success criteria from observations before the PD. So that's a good point in terms of planning ahead. Um, as you're designing your PD, as you're thinking about the PD model, you want to think about what changes would you want to see in teacher classrooms? What are your success criteria? for teachers' um, instruction and build that into the design of the PD and then you can be fair and observe for that afterwards so that you know that you're looking for things that you've taught in your PD. So I think we're going to move along and just have a little bit of time for you to tell us a little more about some of the issues you might be facing in your own settings. Thanks, Candice. So we're sort of moving toward the discussion application a little bit more, as Candice mentioned, um, thinking about what's happening in your own um, school districts and contexts. So um, just sort of giving you the review of the evaluation planning process again, starting with out with the logic model, then moving toward um, the outcomes of interest and then moving towards evaluation questions once you decide what are outcomes of interest. The study design is based on um, the evaluation questions. And then finally, the data sources that you might want to use um, to answer, to gather information from those for those evaluation questions. So we want to give you an opportunity, again, to sort of think about um, how it plays out in your own um, district. So again, we're going to be dealing with a, a, a series of polls here, but it's an opportunity for you to sort of uh, think about that. Um, so one, so the first question and the second question is, what kinds of data related to professional learning and development do you have readily available? And what kinds of data related to PLD are the hardest to get and why? So there's a little bit of opportunity to sort of share a little bit as well in a chat about some of the questions that you, um, or some of the answers that you have in the poll. So we're seeing that, um, that people have interviews and some focus groups, seems like surveys so far is the one that has um, the most readily, one of the most readily available um, with about 66%. Um, others are documents. Um, and notes as well, and then um, quantitative data such as monitoring data like attendance data is coming in second is what, um, what people have readily available. Um, on the other side, what kinds of data are related to PLD that are the hardest to get? People say that observations are very difficult, absolutely agree with that, that can be very difficult. And then interviews. Um, and focus groups are, are also very difficult. Um, if people want to share below a little bit in, your, in the chat uh, about why that is in your particular context, why you have the most, um, or why you, and what, what uh, you say about trying to get access to some of that hard, hard to get data. So, and Candace asked the question, just to clarify a little bit more, which is, does anyone regularly collect observational data? And what data collection methods do you use, um, particularly since observational data is very difficult um, to get access to? So I see Denise and Jesse are typing. So I look forward to hearing what 
your thought car on that. And just keeping in mind is it's really hard to get data, it's really hard to do data collection in general. As you notice that a lot of people said surveys were very easy to do um, because you can get access to them. Uh, Jesse says that they collect observational data via video um, and then they can dissect it later. That's very, um, that's a, um, a common method as well. And Denise says that they're beginning to implement a structure um, for, for that, uh, for collecting observational data in their own districts using the instructional practice guide. Um, and uh, those, are, those are great ways to sort of get a, um, access to observational data. We always like behavioral data as well. And uh, Candace um, says that video can be a less obtrusive way to get observational data since there isn't another person in the classroom. And of course, that's a, that's a good point. Often um, we're intimidated by other folks, so sometimes that can be a, a, um, difficult. And then it's also, Stephanie says that it's a priority not to interrupt instructional time um, as well. So there's not much, uh, therefore much of the pro professional learning development occurs outside of the contract time. Therefore it's not always required. Um, and then Kim says IRB always comes into play. And that's a really good point in terms of trying to be able to pass institutional review board um, in terms of trying to get the type of information that you need. Um, and just to clarify again that the IRB is equal to the Institutional Review Board, which often looks at how well we are, how well designs are put together, and how well we treat the participants that that we bring into our studies and, and evaluations. Um, and then Kim says that sometimes the IRB just won't let you do what you want to do. <laughs> um, and then finally, Candace says, if you're doing research, you would need to submit an application to the Institutional Review Board, um, which looks at whether the research is being done ethically. And that all plays into the kinds of methods that we're able to use and in what way we're um, um, able to use them. And usually districts will have an Institutional Review Board um, or access to one that will help them um, determine how ethical and how well the study is being conducted. Um, and then Kim mentions that even just trying to do this kind of work and figure out, get the kind of data that you want, um, there's a lot of pushback from districts. Um, they're not always willing to let them work directly with students. And, that's, and, and there's reasons, of course, behind that of being able to get um, parental consent as well. Um, so it can be a little bit difficult to sort of make this work. So we see how that, um, so that is. So we understand some of the struggles that, that people have in terms of trying to get the data that they want to get. Um, so we'll move on to our next poll, I believe. We have another one. Um, so the next one um, is uh, sort of, what is the easiest, uh, what stakeholder group, so now we're looking at stakeholder groups and we sort of started talking about that a little bit, is the easiest to get data from and which stakeholder group is the hardest to get data from? And so if you go ahead um, at the top of there, take a look at the polls and um, document your answers and then also share more in the chat box about your, um, your answers. So stakeholder groups are always, that's the big thing. I mean, we're all looking to get inf information and, and get an understanding of how people deal with things. So, of course. Um, so we say the easiest stakeholder group to get so far um, from is teachers, because of course they're there. And then um, second um, would be students. And a lot of that is the fact that they call them sort of the captive audience. They're already there. They're, they're available and often a lot of the work that we're interested in um, concerns them as well. Um, but on the other hand, stakeholder groups um, that's hardest to get data from are students um, so far, and then also families. Families actually sort of trump the students because um, families are outside of the school setting and it's often very difficult to get, um, uh, get access to them. Um, and um, as Candace is sort of noting as a clarif clarification is, 
um, because if anybody correct, uh, anybody regular, regularly collects data from families, and how do you do it if you're able to do that? Um, Denise says that families are the most difficult because you may only get a limited sample based on their entrance and or availability. That's, a, that's definitely a big point. Families are a lot less available um, for the work um, than students and teachers are. Um, other, other comments from folks who often might find it um, easy or hard to get um, information. Are there any, um, any strategies that you have in terms of getting to, for instance, families, to get into reaching those hard to reach um, stakeholder groups? And uh, Candace actually says that sometimes it's helpful to work um, with the local parent centers or parent liaisons. Stephanie says that student data is easiest to, to get due to the registration and assessment data available. And, um, and then Candace also notes that uh, figuring out what events that they're having um, and trying to get data collection during those events, particularly for families, and I find that very useful as well. Often just attending some of those casual events and uh, being able to get to families um, is helpful. Also trying to, to develop a, a, a relationship with them so that they're willing to be part of it and, and feel invested. Um, I see Stephanie typing there, and she might have a, a few more comments as well. Um, and then other folks. And then um, Candace says, says, it would be great to have parents on your evaluation team. And that's a really good point, Candace, because in a lot of ways, um, evaluations are moving towards that in terms of having um, families and students uh, who are actually in, um, involved, invested by being part of the evaluation group. And then um, Stephanie says it's not unusual for the same family, families to participate, so not necessarily getting good rep uh, representation because sometimes you have um, families who are really gung-ho and want to be part of it, and then other families um, who may not have the time or the inclination, it's harder to get them on board as well. Okay. And I think there's one last comment from, uh, from Lauren. Um, if, if you're trying to get survey um, responses from parents, um, sending the survey home um, with the kids would be a little competition. So thank you, everyone, for those comments. And I'm going to turn it over to Candace. All right, so we are at our um, point in our webinar where we'd like to just spend a little time, if you have them, just taking your questions. Um, what questions have come up as you've been listening to our discussion about data collection, study design, data quality issues, um, and maybe any other issues that might come up from the challenges or um, successes you've had doing evaluations of professional learning programs in your context. So feel free to go ahead and type those into the chat, and we'll see if those come in and take your questions. Um, one thing I probably will, uh, I'll note here, but I'll also say again later, is that we have a third webinar which is focused on using evaluation results, disseminating evaluation results, and also working with um, the logistics of planning an evaluation, so timing, budgeting, um, working with an external evaluator if you choose to have one. So um, if you have questions about those, be sure to stay tuned for our third session, um, which will be coming up in January. And we are happy to take those questions um, now if we, if we can answer them, but certainly we'll answer them in January. Take a look at the chat. Doesn't look like anything has come in yet. Um, we'll also give you a few more minutes. Um, Will there be opportunities in the future to dig a little deeper? So uh, yes, I, Stephanie, I totally appreciate this question. This is um, a 90-minute webinar, <laughs> so we obviously cannot go into um, the level of depth you would take, for example, if you were getting uh, an evaluation course. Um, but I, you, know, you can stay tuned for the third session in this series. Um, if you're here in the Northeast region, uh, you can always reach out to us at RELME. Um, to think about other opportunities to get involved in um, some of the technical assistance that we provide around evaluation. Um, we also, at the end of this 
presentation. If you download the slides from the presentation, we have the resources slide at the very end. And that has the citations that you've been seeing um, from these slides. So we would really recommend um, looking through those resources and reading through those resources um, so that you can get a little bit more information. And I'll just flag one resource right now, which is the Giancola resource. This was actually where this continuous evaluation model comes from. And this resource um, was created for educators, practitioners, people who are not researchers. Um, but it could be applicable, again, if you are a researcher or an evaluator. And just presents everything in a very clear manner. Um, so I would definitely recommend reading through that. Um, and then I know, Katrina, you have a favorite textbook that you've been referring to uh, for people who maybe want to dig a little more into the methods. Absolutely. Yeah, one of my, my favorite textbooks um, is actually Mertens and Wilson. And it's a 2012 pre, um, uh, volume. And it's really great for just really digging into the methods and even some of the, the aspects of, of just uh, the budgeting and time, some of the things that we've been talking about and we'll continue to talk about. So, but great resource. And that's also located in our references slide. So um, we'd recommend that you download the slides. You can take a look at the references, um, see if that gets you toward what you want. Um, and then our emails are also at the end. Um, so you can feel free to reach out to me, to Katrina, um, and then see, uh, ask your questions. And then we can also follow up with you. Any other questions that have come in as you've been listening? Well, I don't see any right now. So I'm going to go ahead. And if we get some in our last couple of minutes, um, we can be sure to do that, or be sure to take your questions. Um, but basically, what we have talked about today was um, the connection between evaluation questions and study design, and also data collection ideas and sources. Um, we also ended with talking a little bit about enhancing data quality. This is that five-step continuous evaluation model that we talked through today. Um, we will be um, going through steps four and five in our third and last session, which is happening on January 25th. So please join us. If this is interesting to you, please join us January 25th from 3 to 4.30 PM Eastern. As I mentioned, we're going to talk a little bit more about disseminating and using evaluation information and logistics, such as working with external evaluators, timelines, budgets. Um, all of those things that come into play when you're planning for an evaluation. So we hope to see you then. And as I also mentioned, this is our, uh, these are our email addresses. You can feel free to email me or Katrina um, and ask any follow-up questions. Or we also welcome you to visit the RELME website, which is linked through here. Um, thanks so much for joining us today. As we uh, wrap up for today, we hope to see you in January and in the new year. Thanks, Candice. This is Ashley Gaddis, again, the Dissemination Manager. I just wanted to thank everyone again for joining us today and to remind you that we did record today's webinar. And it will be archived and uploaded to the IES YouTube channel. If you registered for, for today's webinar, you will receive an email with, from us with a link to the recording when it is available. And we hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you again for joining us.